Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to How to Rock the Virtual Stage on the Trigger Rich Bond Trigger. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. I hope you guys are all doing well. You guys are in for a treat tonight. Uh, we have one of the hottest topics so far that we have conquered here on the virtual stage. Uh, my email, uh, the different platforms I'm on have been going crazy all day long. Um, it even spun out on a different Facebook page that I'm not even normally on and the thread exploded. So as we get into this night, a couple of ground rules for everybody as I see Alan and Fred and uh, Robin coming on here tonight. Thanks for jumping on in everybody. We're gonna do uh, 30 minutes of co-coaching, dialoguing, discussion. The second half, we're gonna open it up for your questions. We'll put them in the chat box, do things like that. And we may bring you on virtually but uh, this is all part of the new interactive way we're learning how to do this. But one of the things tonight, since we are talking about the virtual school, the virtual stage, virtual education, uh, today some of the comments were pretty antagonistic. And uh, Tyler, when we get into this, I don't know if you run into that or not, but part of the discussion is there's a very strong venom and energy of people either really want it or they want school back. So I just ask everybody in their own mindset tonight as we open up the discussion to let's be respectful, uh, let's have a good dialogue, let's ask good questions, but let's not go down a rabbit trail that's disrespectful or anything else like that. Uh, we really don't want to go that direction. Um, tonight, Tyler Christensen is with us on How to Rock the Virtual Stage. Tyler is a teacher, but the real cool thing is he also has a new platform, a new way of reaching into the schools. He is doing virtual assemblies. And it sounds just like what you think it sounds like. He is literally trying to leverage and bring in speakers, leaders, special guests, and beam them into the classroom so teachers can have great content still besides what they normally are gonna do. Also part of the discussion here tonight obviously is how you do this better. And how do you make it for the teachers more engaging, the students more engaged? There's so much to cover here. So everyone give a warm welcome. And if you have the thumbs up or if you have the applause clap, or if you want to type in the channel, give a bunch of C's or yays or whatever you want to do. Everyone welcome Tyler Christensen to the show tonight with me. <laughs> You're on, buddy. All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. Just a, a little background about me. I. I am a teacher. Um, I'm teaching elementary school right now, but actually my background is as a professor. So I taught educational technology for 10 years. And, and so going virtual and doing online is not brand new to me, but certainly doing it from an elementary school classroom. Yeah, we, we didn't use tech at all in my classroom prior to this. And so this is a new thing for me uh, in, in that context. Uh, and I'm learning and growing just like everyone else. But um, as Rich mentioned earlier, I've, one thing that I tried in the spring when we started learning from home was doing virtual school assemblies. And I just started reaching out to my own network, speakers that I knew, uh, people that I've worked with. Um, I had a TED Talk canceled and that's when I, so I was a, a speaker and doing a bunch of assemblies. And the week that my TED Talk got canceled, I came home and thought, there's got to be a way to bring speakers to kids now that we're learning from home. So I reached out and started um, getting people to come on to my virtual stage and they would just share mini versions of their, their keynote addresses because we didn't want it to be the full length of, of an assembly. Um, that's too much for the kids. I wanted something short. And so we did this hybrid model where they do like a mini presentation, almost like a TED talk. So a five to 10 minute presentation and then some Q&A. And sometimes those questions would be my students uh, that would let me know in advance. And so I'd act as the moderator. Other times it was just things I came up with on the fly. But we did that every single day during the pandemic. So we put out 50 episodes. It's up on YouTube right now. So if you want to check them out, it's just a virtual school assembly on YouTube. And we have 50 as assemblies up, which will be there for forever. Um, it's a free resource that teachers can use in their classroom. And I'm stoked about it because I'm gonna use this. You know, moving forward, I don't have to redo this every time. I now have 50 assemblies I can pick from to use whenever I have extra time in the classroom and stuff like that. But then the cool thing is moving into the summer, I decided I wanted to have this resource for my students. I was looking at what they were struggling with, with their physical health, their mental health, 
uh, getting out and, and moving, trying new things, living in a world of uncertainty. So I really went hard uh, this summer and I did another 100 episodes. So I've interviewed 100 people and it's not just random people off the street. Today I did uh, six interviews. I did do Rich and so he, he came on to talk. He did a professional development session for teachers. Uh, but just today I talked to two Olympians, a Paralympian, two actors in New York uh, and a director. So we, you know, those are the kinds of people we have coming on the show. And we can talk about this later, but I've been amazed with how willing people are to come in to volunteer their time. Uh, I had one of my actors in New York that's worked with some amazing people and has done a lot of cool movies and things that he totally took this seriously. He prepared for it. He wrote a new speech just for the virtual stage. And it was just a phenomenal episode. It was one of the most enjoyable things I've done in a long time just because he was so committed to helping kids out. And he talked about his childhood and some of the bullying that he experienced when he was in high school and was really vulnerable. And there are people right now who want to share. So a, a virtual stage is a way that we have access like never before to people that we can bring into our classroom. So uh, I'll start with that and, and turn it back over to Rich. That's a 30,000 feet flyover in like four minutes. So everyone take a deep breath with me because we're going to strap it on tonight. And we got so much ground. Tyler, thank you very much. As we get going here for a second, Tyler, type in that website that, uh, that you could do so everyone can go find this content that you've already created. Also, I'm going to drop a poll in here. And we're going to have some feedback throughout this whole thing. And I'm going to ask everybody, how confident are you in the virtual classroom having a positive effect on students? How confident are you that the virtual classroom will have a positive impact on the students? I'm going to drop the poll up right now. And we're going to launch the poll here for a few minutes. We're going to let this run. And everyone cast a vote. Tyler and I cannot vote. We are exempt from this right now. But I want to see what you guys are thinking about the confidence. Because one of the things, Tyler, and I want to start here maybe, because of the feedback I got today on a couple other platforms is, People are on one side of the coin or other. They are like, yeah, bring on the virtual school. I'm not ready to go back. COVID's freaking me out. I don't want my personal career and life to blow up because I have to go back if they have to come home. And the other side is no, because virtual school will never be good enough for my kid in their education. So just start us off there. How are you navigating that? What are you hearing? And how should we respond to this? Uh, I'm hearing the same stuff, of course, and even from teachers, we're hearing the same thing. Some teachers are excited about the possibilities of doing more online education and virtual things. Um, most teachers, however, are the opposite. They're really nervous about it. They've been teaching the same way for many, many years, and so it's a lot more work to support a virtual platform. Uh, but also, there are uh, issues that come up as far as getting hacked and things like that. Um, not having the same face-to-face. -face. There's no replacement for face-to-face, -face, but that doesn't mean you can't have awesome, authentic experiences. And, and a lot of teachers recognize that. And so, you know, a lot of teachers are doing innovative things. Um, like I did with virtual school assemblies, one of the cool things that teachers are excited about is, you know, I, I started filming all my math lessons and I have that for forever. So if a student misses class, now I have that extra resource that I'm building once and I can use it many, many times. Now I'll still update those from time to time, but I think a lot of teachers are excited at that prospect. Are parents nervous? Yeah, I, I have four kids of my own and we still don't know what we're gonna do when school starts here in a few weeks because we're really nervous about the situation. And so um, I think you know we're seeing all sides of that. Well, we're gonna wrap up the poll here, cast your final votes. If you don't wanna get, get that vote in, please. Uh, how confident are you about the virtual stage and the schools? And we're going to close this off and we're going to end the poll right now. And let's show everybody, just curious, here we're going to share the results out there now. And it looks like better than nothing <laughs> and extremely helpful. So, People are hoping for the best, it looks like, here in this particular uh, sampling tonight. Thank you all for uh, going in there, Robin, Al, Brian, Fred, Kay, and uh, Mirren. Uh, so we do have another poll. We're going to throw that in later on. But speak to that right there. 
is that the sense that you're getting, Tyler, that people are at least more optimistic, or is it just all over the map so much you can't even get a good pulse on it? No, I think we have a more positive crowd here tonight than what I'm seeing. Uh, a lot of parents, a lot of students, a lot of teachers are really, really nervous. I think I'm seeing way more of that about, you know, just apprehension, anxiety uh, with going more virtual. Uh, and then I think the minority is people who are optimistic, see the benefits. Um, and, and those are the teachers who are, are going full steam ahead. And I know just with my own school, there are a few teachers that are leading the charge with this online stuff and, and they're doing an amazing work, but they're also like shouldering the load for a lot of the other teachers that are, are anxious about it. Now we're going to do some tips, some uh, and uh, I, ideas to help everyone out to better do this. If you're a teacher, if you are a parent, uh, we all play a part of this now. This is not just a student. This is not just a parent. Um, and so I was on several Zoom calls today. In fact, one I just jumped off a little while ago is high executive leaders. The presenter this afternoon, one of them had their closet in the background. Highly productive female. She rocked it with engagement, storytelling, but we're looking at her wardrobe. And the other one literally had the camera. He was looking at a monitor in front of him, but the other one, his visual shot was coming from below his chin. So you're looking up his nostril the whole time. He's an executive that helped launch Xbox, okay? Presentation matters, everybody. And that's one of the biggest things that I think is the biggest struggle for so many of us when the school presentation. I know the teachers I talked to, Tyler, have said, I stink on camera. I have no idea what to do. Give some pointers right away to help everyone change to this school year. What have we learned and what should they be doing to make it a better engagement? Yeah, well, I think some of the things you already mentioned, obviously how you stage your virtual uh, classroom is important. Keeping the clutter away, tinkering around with lighting and sound and things like that. And I think a lot of teachers have done that. Um, if they're just doing it straight off their phone or a Chromebook or something like that, that's not the end of the world. That can work just fine. But sometimes it means setting a few books underneath your Chromebook so it's looking at you directly um, and doing those little things. So I, I, I think really that's the first step for teachers is what are the easy things that I can control that I don't need any technical know-how, you know, and it's just setting something up in, in a, an area with good lighting uh, where you're not going to be interrupted, your cat's not going to jump on the computer, you know, your baby's not going to cry or, or whatever that is, is just finding a good place with, with you know, a, a decent background that's not going to be distracting. So I, I think that's uh, step one for teachers. And I think most teachers have now figured that out. Um, but I, like you, I'm surprised. I, I you know, I uh, interviewed a really, really famous person, A-list celebrity uh, last week. And he had drool coming off his beard uh, because he had just woken up and was, you know, and so that happens. And sometimes, you know, fortunately in an interview situation, you can bring that up and fix things on the fly. But that's not, you know, when you're doing a parent teacher conference or when you're talking to your students as a teacher, you need to be prepared going into it. Well, and again, that's a whole nother thing I never even thought of parent teacher conferences. Wow. That's a whole nother conversation here. Um, so, I coach everybody, and you and I talked about this on your show. I tell everybody, stand up. Present mm -hmm. like you're in the room, in the environment. Uh, I was on another call today. One of the person was like, so what's your number one tip? I told them, and they literally, again, in the middle of the discussion, stood up, started to move, and they say, this is totally different. Um, should teachers be standing, or they should be sitting at their desk like you are right now? Which, and the last time we talked, we had a good debate about this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it comes down to personal preference. When I'm in the classroom, as often, now I'm a mover, I'm walking around the classroom, I'm doing a lot of things. But when I'm not walking around the classroom, I'm often sitting on a desk. That's how I present. That's how I have more casual conversations with my students. That's where I'm comfortable as a teacher and my students are comfortable with me in that situation. So when I present to my students, um, when I'm in the classroom and I'm filming a lesson, like if I'm doing a math lesson and I'm up at the board, obviously I'm standing, I've set up my camera so I can do that. But if I'm just having a conversation with students and I'm going over announcements and talking about what's going to happen that day, or if I'm talking to parents and doing communication, 
I'm much more comfortable sitting and, and I haven't had any negative feedback on that. I'm not trying to entertain during that part. It's, it's about communication and getting information to the parents or the students. And so uh, I think it depends on your situation. Uh, there's a time to stand and there's a time to sit. Brian, uh, I see your question coming in the chat box. Thank you for filling up the chat box, guys. Uh, and we will open up the uh, question and answer box as well. But Brian's asking the question that I talk about a lot of time, environments. What environment are you creating? Now, I use a virtual green screen. I can change my environments. Like if you're doing history now, you can literally go to the Vietnam Wall and talk about the Vietnam Wall. You can take them there, or you can do the stage setup where if you're doing science and lab, put some bottles out, put some chem set stuff, and create the environment. So Brian's kind of asking, what can we do to make it more engaging, both visually and emotion, probably, I'm kind of assuming here, Brian. So Tyler, how do you do that? Should teachers go virtual? Should they go with props? What's the best way to raise that level with the environments? Yeah, I, I think you have a lot of the same engagement issues that you would have in a normal physical classroom on the virtual stage. And so as a teacher, some of the things that we do to be more engaging is we get away from lecture and we have more discussion based. Um, we have, you know, props that we show or visuals. Uh, we might bring in a video clip or an audio clip and you can do all those things virtually. So the things that would be engaging in the classroom, you can find a way to do it in the, on the virtual stage. Now, it might require a little more preparation. Um, certainly, when I have my students do discussion groups, if it's on a Zoom call, setting up those groups and, and you can do it randomly or you can assign certain people and have those breakout sessions. Um, there, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. I love doing that because they can be in small groups. It's harder, like in a classroom, I can walk around from group to group and virtually I can do the same thing. I can pop in from group to group, but it's not as seamless. It, it takes practice. And, and so, you know, it's one of those things where you take the, your best practices from the classroom, you try to implement on the virtual stage and it's a lot of trial and error right now, um, at least for me, because this is new for me. And so I'm trying things out, but I have found that you can be just as engaging in a virtual environment. Well, and that breakout thing is huge. And like you said, as the host, you can jump in and jump out. You can go the table to table. Uh, and again, I was in some meetings today and we had a great time with it. You can also put a timer on them. There's a lot of things you can learn behind the scenes. And that's why people like Tyler, myself and others right now are trying to coach this up because there's so much to learn. Now for teachers, they have lesson plans. They have things to accomplish. They have threshold to hit and gold every quarter. One of the knocks I heard this last since COVID hit, everyone dove off the deep end. It was really dummy down. It was really simple. They were repeating lessons. Um, what do you think the bar is going to be for raising the bar of education versus dumbing it down? Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a greater divide uh, between the teachers that have always done the same things the same ways and, and rely on old materials that are still using worksheet packets in their classrooms and doing a lot of busy work, it's going to be really obvious that those teachers aren't, aren't making the effort to be engaging and innovative. Um, on the flip side of that, I think teachers that are really tackling this head on and trying to be engaging, I think that they're going to see that there are a lot of benefits to being virtual, that you're creating resources that you can reuse, that you're bringing in outside people that have never been willing to come into your classroom before, but now want to help out. So we're in this unique time right now where you can take advantage of a lot of free resources. People are making internet available for free in some areas um, and other technologies available for free. Libraries are opening up a lot of their online resources. Um, and a lot of the companies that we use in education for our software, they're di giving discounts and, and even free trials to try things out. So for those that are taking advantage of those kinds of resources, this is like the best time ever to be a teacher because we have so many opportunities available to us. So we're going to put our next poll up here because we're playing into this conversation. Perfect timing for it. What is your mind on the biggest issues for the virtual classroom. What do you think? You, you've joined us here tonight. We want to hear from you. I gave you multiple choices here, but what do you think in your mind is the biggest issues with the virtual classroom? I'm going to launch this poll, let you all chime in. Because again, we're throwing out some of our ideas. Now, you were just talking about taking advantage of things. 
taking an advantage, teachers may not be tech savvy, but you have students that are. Tyler, is it possible one of the engagement tricks is to have tech help from your students? Because if we're doing more and more of this, off camera support, behind the scenes support becomes more important. Can you engage your students to get them more involved by being tech support? You can, but it, it's problematic because, for example, in the past when I do small groups and I have students that were, will mentor and help other students, so I have students that go around and tutor in the different groups and help. I try to stay as hands-off as I can when it comes to those kind of situations and opportunities. Now, that's way harder to do in a virtual situation because they're not the host. They're not the ones running the show. And so setting up some of those kind of connections are, are problematic. Now, if a teacher needs help with something and they just say, hey, I can't figure out how to do this, and they have 20 kids on their screen that are tech savvy, yeah, they're going to get an answer really easy. And so it's just, you know, for those teachers who haven't learned how to troubleshoot with technology, aren't really good at doing Google searches and YouTube searches, their students can do that for them. Um, I, I don't know if that's a huge thing because most of those teachers that are, are really struggling with that they're probably also the teachers who are reluctant to ask for help. And so there's a problem with that. Um, All right. But yeah. We're going to wind down the poll. I think everyone got in. Interesting results. Everyone take a look at this. This is very interesting when it comes to what do you think might be the biggest issues? And I'm going to show this right away because lack of engagement is number one, but look how balanced Technology is not as high as I thought it would be. Other issues here seem to be the biggest concern of our group here tonight. Speak to some of these, will you, Tyler? Yeah, so obviously technology is going to be a bigger issue depending on where you live and the socioeconomic uh, background of your students, your demographics. Um, and same with no internet at home. That's going to be a, a bigger issue in some areas than others. I want to come um, back to that one in a minute. Now, a lot of schools and a lot of uh, organizations are doing a lot to help with that. And so I think we're going to see improvement in those areas. Um, we have more technology resources, more internet available to us than ever before. So I, I think that's an, uh, an awesome thing. Teacher presentation skills uh, is a concern. And I think that that's a really good concern. I, you know, I had that concern before COVID. There are a lot of teachers who don't know how to teach very well and, and have poor presentation skills. And I do think that it is harder to be engaging on a screen. You know, I haven't been very over the top today. I haven't been very energetic. And quite honestly, when I'm teaching my fifth graders, I'm not that way either. You know, and so if you have a hard, a hard time keeping attention in a normal classroom, it's going to be even harder in a virtual environment. So I think that's a valid concern. Um, the last one there with my students not trying at all. Unfortunately, uh, again, I think that this is a hard, we're, we're giving everyone a hard pass right now. And I saw this in the spring, you know, we're, we're giving everyone the benefit of a doubt. So if a, a student's even showing up at all, we're, we were rewarding that way beyond what they probably deserve. I think we'll temper that a little bit in the fall. Now that we've tried some different things out, we'll have different expectations. We'll expect a little more from our students, um, but there will be students absolutely that game the system that do the bare minimums and it's just like in our normal classroom we have students that figure out what's the bare minimum i need to do to get an a or a c or a d minus and they'll do that bare minimum um i think we'll at, at least initially with the online environment require less than we would normally face to face and some students will take advantage of that so two things go through my mind because there's so many different ways of looking at it, but you you mentioned parent teachers conferences Let's talk about the parental side here for a second, because the students, teacher, teachers are going to have to practice. They are going to have to roll tape like I coach people on. Mm -hmm. Teachers are going to have to practice now to get ready for a better summer, uh, fall, and they're going to have to just learn technology. And Zoom and other platforms are changing so fastly right now. They have to learn. The learning curve for them is so big. But let's go back to parents. Because one of the complaints I heard was, I have no idea what's going on in school. I don't know how to help my student. And I sure have no idea how to help them with a virtual assignment. What can parents do to better prepare to be a better support for their students this fall virtually? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing is communication. And I saw this again, I have four children of my own. And in the spring, I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning so I could set up my classroom for my students, film things, get some communication out, set everything up for the day. Then by 8.30 or 9, I was helping my four students or children at home. And then at lunchtime, I was checking back in with my class, grading things, wrapping things up. And they were long, brutal days for me. Um, as a parent, I, I know the frustration because I wasn't dealing with four teachers. I have two middle schoolers. So I was dealing with 17 teachers. And they all taught in different ways. They communicated in different ways. They had different expectations. Some of them had no online you know, experience. And so the best thing that I could do as a parent to help them was check in with them from time to time, um, show some grace. Like if they were messing up, you know, be forgiving of that and, and try to be understanding, help out where you can. Um, but honestly, there was a lot of handholding. Parents were way too involved in the spring because teachers didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> now, that won't be as big, as much the case in the fall. I think teachers have now had enough time to mess around with things, learn from what they did in the spring that it will take some of that burden off the parents that were very involved before. But, but listen, here's one of the cool things about this. As a teacher, one of the neatest things that happened for me in the spring is there were parents, my, my most at-risk students, that I never met their parents. They never came to parent-teacher conferences. I never saw them. They never responded to emails. I could get them on Zoom calls. And so I met parents that I hadn't seen all year long that I could get on a call to catch up, talk about their kids. I had way more parent-teacher um, discussions that last trimester of the year than I did the rest of the year put together. And I think there's some real benefits to that. I was really upfront with my communication. I did YouTube videos every day for my classes and said, this is exactly what's expected. The parents could watch those. And so if parents are on board and teachers let them know where to go to find the information, parents can really be a huge help to you right now. I just saw a great chime come in through the chat. We're going to go in there in a second. In a few moments, what I'm going to do is make this so interactive because we're trying to show you how interactive webinars and things. We're going to do this with you, everyone on the call tonight. I'm going to bring everyone in as a panelist. Uh, right now, the dialogue is between Tyler and I. So webinars are different than the Zoom meetings. Zoom meetings, you have the Brady Bunch box. Some teachers are using that. Some teachers are using Zoom webinars. So part of the experiment is learning this. So in a few minutes, I'm going to open it up. You're all going to become panelists. We'll all be back in this together. You'll have open microphones, and you'll be able to ask Tyler and myself questions to really get straight answers for the second half of the show. But the question here is, cancel the student's cell phone. One of the things teachers are competing with is the cell phone, the off-camera activity. Is there gonna be, because policies of schools of no gum, no this, no that, how do you work to say a policy of phones down, pay attention so you can engage? Is there any talk of how to balance that stuff? Well, it's tricky because if they're at home, you can't take it away from them. Their parents have to, right? And so when we were meeting face-to-face, -face, my school has a no cell phone policy, so students can't have that. We had more issues with smart watches um, and notifications coming in, students texting from their watches um, because they couldn't have phones, and technically they couldn't have smart watches either, but it was an easier thing to sneak in or whatever. Um, so are we going to have issues in a virtual environment? Um, I, and I will say this, whether you're face-to-face -face or virtual in the fall, there's going to be more of a hybrid model for everyone. There's going to be more online resources. And so um, it's something that we have to deal with. I just had my phone go off. We're going to have those distractions in the classroom. So it's one of those things. When I taught educational technology at the university level, I had an open technology policy. You could bring whatever you wanted to class. You could play World of Warcraft in the middle of class if you were willing to have that open so the whole class could see what you're doing. And we just talked about technology etiquette. You know, don't be a jerk. If, you're, if you have a phone call, go take it out in the hallway. And so I think now is a similar opportunity, no matter what grade you're teaching, to talk about technology etiquette, to talk about cyberbullying, to talk about social media, and how you can utilize those to your advantage as a teacher, uh, but also just how to be a good human being and be respectful. So we need to have those conversations. It's going to open up a lot more discussions, a lot more. So um, while I'm going to bring some, everybody in here, but while I'm doing that, 
Uh, give us one or two of the best um, new tips that you could give teachers for this coming year. What are the top three things that Tyler would say, teachers, really focus on this. It's going to set you aside and help you keep rocking uh, as we get rolling this year. Yeah. Number one tip, divide and conquer. If you're on a team, if you're in a grade level team or a content level team, don't be doing all the same things as everyone else. Uh, so take ownership over one area of expertise and really master that and make those resources available to others. And other teachers will do the same for you so you don't have to all reinvent the wheel. Um, I've been doing that this summer. This is the first summer ever where I've regularly met with my team. We've had weekly meetings and we've been building resources. We're better prepared to teach this fall than we ever have been in the past. And I think it's because of the divide and conquer. So that's number one. Number two, we've talked about already, but use your parents and make sure that you're communicating often with them. Um, communication's key with technology issues. And so making sure you're doing that. Um, and then I guess my third tip would be still have a personality, still be yourself as a teacher, find those things that made your classroom magical before and find a way to do that in the virtual environment. And that might be tricky. Um, one of the things that I love to do in my classroom is we have class auctions where students can use the money they've saved up, the honey money that we have in our um, classroom. Yeah, just my, just my final point as far as your personality in the classroom. And this, I know most of you guys aren't even teachers. And so this applies to the other things you're doing virtually is let your personality shine in. I was talking about how I do auctions in my classroom and we did a virtual auction at the end of the classroom. So I was still in the classroom by myself. I bid, I, I had all my students in a Zoom room and they were doing the auctioning and bidding on things and then it was awesome for me because I got to drive all over the county to deliver their ukulele to them or their drone or their skateboard. We have cool rewards in my classroom. Uh, and so I was driving all around the county. It took me like two days just to drive to drop things off. Most of my students got books and stuff like that. And it was a really cool moment. It was something we would have done normally in the classroom. We find, found a way to do it virtually. And so we still had the, that moment as a classroom. And you can do that no matter what your profession is. So we're going to open this up. I'm going to ask everyone to do what we would do in school now. This is one of the techniques. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand up on the video screen. Uh, and we are going to open this up so everyone can fully participate. And then I want to mute you, and you can shoot your question off to Tyler or myself. We both coach this. We're both really in the middle of it. He's on the ground level because of being a teacher, and I'm coaching people from the business executive. They're all dealing with the same things right now. So uh, everyone's got a question, raise a hand, and let's start firing away. I can't believe this crowd is bashful. All right, uh, Brian, give me a second here. We'll get Brian to come on and join us. All right, Brian, you should be good now. Okay, I think I, am I being, all right, good, good? You're good. Hey, thanks for putting this together, uh, gentlemen. Uh, so I'm a, I'm not a teacher. Um, I'm a scoutmaster though. So I, I do, and I've had a lot of experience hosting virtual uh, trainings with kids as a result. And I have, I have two kids, uh, one in middle school, one in high school. And honestly, last spring was a complete waste for them. They, they, the, they, they were completely unengaged. They, they were checked out. The teachers were having just amazing problems with pivoting from a live classroom to a virtual classroom um, no, and no fault of their own. I mean, it was, a, it was just an abrupt thing. Right. So, um, you know, th there is a definite new set of skills that as a speaker and a coach that are required to be able to keep an audience engaged. It's hard enough to keep adults engaged. Um, you know, and, 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 and you know, with, 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 with our content, when you're delivering that in a virtual environment, let alone a, an 11 year old. So, um, I guess, my question is, are, are, are you aware of specific programs that are being provided to the um, educational systems, you know, the middle schools, the elementary schools, the high school teachers and educators to help get them, uh, to help them pivot their material so that they can actually deliver it in a way that is meaningful, engaging. Um, it's one thing for, for you to bring props to the, to the screen, a whole nother thing to get those kids to like be engaged. And I, I came up with my own set of standards when I was running troop meetings um, to help do that. But it, it took 
a considerable amount of thought. Yeah. Great question. Uh, Tyler, you want to take that? Sure. Um, yeah. And so I'm a former scout master myself. I, ah. I, so I <laughs> cool. understand how, how challenging that can be. And with my two boys that are in scouts right now, uh, they, they just stopped. There's nothing that has happened since COVID. And so I, I understand. You can, you can join our troop if you want. We're going. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so it, it is a challenge as far as what that's looking like in the classroom. Um, our, our district and our school has been provided resources and we are pivoting as a school. So I don't know if it's going to help with meaningfulness and engagement um, right now. Right now, it's just figuring out technology and getting resources available. So it's the bare level you know, that minimum level. And I think we'll see that in other areas. So, you know, with scouting and things like that, I think we're starting uh, again at the ground level and it's figuring out how can I best communicate? How can I best facilitate different things? And it does take a lot of extra thought right now. Now, the good news is you do the hard thinking now and it's going to serve you for years and years to come. And so when we need to pivot in the future, when things go and we need to do a virtual meeting, periodically right now it's all the time but in the future it will be periodic um, you're going to be much better equipped to deal with that as far as specific software and things like that I don't really have any recommendations I know that my school's moving to a new platform to facilitate online learning but we haven't done it yet so I don't know if it's awesome or not so uh, I'm not sure yet great question Brian by the way there are coaches trying to get out there like myself to get in the school systems to have that very dialogue and very question go on because there's just so much and they want to make content, but they also do want to deliver it well. And it's a whole new playground for them. And uh, I've talked to three other people, Tyler, like yourself, that have mm -hmm. said, yeah, our school is getting something new. We don't know what it is. And we're five, six weeks away from it. And so the learning curve for teachers right now is very high as well, right? Yeah. Anyone else got a question? Okay, uh, Fred, let me bring you on here. And Fred, you should be unmuted now. No, hang on. There, you, sh you should be able to go now. good? I'm good? Yep. yep. Okay. I, you know, fr from my personal experience, right before COVID hit, I was in an auditorium with 390 kids, presenting to 390 kids. And um, Tyler, I want to just say something about sitting down. Mm -hmm. I, I hopped up on the stage and just sat on the edge of the stage and you could just see the kids were just like, I mean, you, you don't always have to stand. But anyways, I want to get back to my point. <laughs> my point is that when, when, when COVID hit, I have all this time and I'm working on a new presentation for myself. And then I got to thinking, you know something, I need to learn how to speak on camera. And I will tell you that it is easy. It's so much easier standing in front of 400 kids in an auditorium than it is to speak. Yep. So I, I'm wondering with, with teachers, if the first step isn't just being comfortable on camera because they have the skill, you know, most of them have the skills to teach and it is a new thing to learn, but if you can't be comfortable, I'm telling you, it's a whole different animal speaking digitally. So that's, that was my thought. That's a great question, Fred. Yeah. Tyler, take that, man. Well, I, I totally agree with you. I think, um, so I do a lot of speaking to in assemblies and go around to different schools. The week that COVID hit for me, my TED talk was canceled. I was just on my way to fly to San Francisco. I had five assemblies that week. It was my spring break. So I had something every day. Um, and three of them were canceled. I went to two others where they they did weird things where like it was only two grades instead of the whole school. And it, it was, it's really changed things for speakers and coaches. Absolutely. Um, but one of the best things that I did last year is in, you know, I didn't know COVID was coming, but when the year started, I decided to start doing more video for, for my classes. And so I had a YouTube channel where every week I did the newsletter for my parents. I put it on the YouTube channel. It was an unlisted video. So I just send them the link. And some parents just raved about that, that they knew exactly what was happening in the classroom from week to week, exactly what was expected of the students. And so I had that benefit that I'd been practicing all year. I started filming my math lessons from time to time, my social studies lessons from time to time. If there was a tricky lesson, I would film it and put it up. So I'd practice. 
And so when COVID came, I was able to then, I, I took ownership over math for the whole grade. I filmed all the math lessons. We not only did all our students start watching it, but because it was on YouTube, then I had people from all over the world starting to watch these math lessons. And that's one of the cool things is once you do get comfortable behind a screen, it's weird at the beginning, but once you get used to it, now you have this resource that we've never had before. And speakers and coaches are, are one of the audiences where it's crazy that, you know, we use our demo reel and people will watch those videos. But when you go to most speakers, even really top, you know, your $25,000 keynote speakers, and you go to their YouTube channel, most of their videos have six views. And I think this is an opportunity for all of us to get used to telling stories in a short, engaging way, to practice doing what we do on stage in a different medium. And I think this is a real opportunity for speakers to, to get comfortable because we can use this for forever. Well, and just to talk about the speaker side, I've, I've been a broadcaster and a speaker and a coach. Broadcasters, if you have friends that are broadcasters in your region, reach out to them. They have a leg up. We've been behind the microphone. We've been behind the camera. So the transition for us is we are resources available to you, to your schools, to coach you up and do better. Because I know a lot of speakers, and Al's also a fellow speaker, by the way. Al probably knows them too. They should never be on camera until they get it right. And the teachers, that's the same feeling right now. It's a whole new thing. Where do you look? How do you look at the Brady Bunch screen? How do you call out troubles in the, I mean, there's so many things right now that it's hard to do until you get comfortable with it. So Fred, you're right. This is a, a, a new comfort zone. The thing is teachers have all summer right now. If they're preparing, like Tyler's talking about, they should be ready to go more comfortable. If they think August 15th, August 20th, turn on the camera, they may not be doing quite as well. Great question, Nolan. What other question? Who else wants to raise a hand and shout out here? Um, this is Joanne. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, and I am also a coach myself. <laughs> Welcome to the tribe. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but interestingly enough, I'm a business owner. Of course, I'm not a teacher. Uh, but I also am a Toastmaster. And I actually started a Toastmasters club that's called the uh, Vallejo Entrepreneurs and Business Professionals Toastmasters. Now, we used to meet in person, but of course, when COVID hit, we had to pivot. <laughs> I call it the pandemic pivot. So we had to do the pandemic pivot. And, <laughs> and now we're all on Zoom. And uh, what Brian was saying, I totally agree with. You totally have to learn how to, when you're speaking in front of a group of people, it's very different from the camera, making sure your eyes are geared toward the, the camera and not wandering. Because I think it took a while for people to kind of get used to that. And while we miss speaking, doing public speaking in person, I think there's a greater appreciation for the fact that because everything is so virtual right now, that everybody is understanding that this is an opportunity for you to learn public speaking skills on camera. So all of the Toastmasters Club, just so you guys know, are on Zoom. And it really doesn't matter where you are. You can pretty much join a Toastmasters Club and the price for that is minimal. You know, it's ridiculously low. It's very reasonable. And I really encourage that because it's a definitely an opportunity. You get to determine when you're going to speak. You sign up for it. They don't sign you up. But just meeting every week and getting that chance to speak in front of others and getting feedback, actually, because there's evaluations that come with you giving your speech. So that's a, 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 an added bonus. So just something just I thought I'd throw out there. No, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Tyler, what are schools doing, by the way, to better coach people? What are they doing? Are, are you guys having breakouts? Are you guys having discussions of let's practice together? Is there any of that going on? Uh, not, not much. Over the summers, I think most schools like my school have tried to be hands off to let teachers, you know, take a summer do the things they need to do on their own, not have be overwhelmed by meetings. Now I'm meeting with my team, but that's something we decided to do independent of the school. We just wanted to do that. 
Um, but most schools are not, don't have any mandatory meetings during the summer and things like that. Now, I think most schools, again, like my school, will probably start their pre, you know, training usually the first week or two before school starts, you do professional development and they're not hiring a lot of outside speakers. Budgets have been slashed. And so there is some virtual professional development going on, but I think teachers will have more time coming back early to work through things together, to meet with their groups together and go through things. So I, I do think teachers will have more support early in the year than they're used to having. Awesome. Al, I'm going to bring you in here, Al. Awesome. Al and I just met the other day, and Al's already hanging out. We're spending more time together than ever before, Al. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joanne made a very good point about Toastmasters uh, giving you the opportunity to speak virtually. I've been uh, running an alternative. I've been in Toastmasters since the 1980s, and great, op uh, great organization. Uh, three years ago, I started a thing called the Public Speakers Club because uh, – I wasn't pleased with the amount of stage time I got at Toastmasters. So the Public Speakers Club meets every single week. If you show up, you get to speak every single week. Since March, mm -hmm. we've been doing it uh, online. And uh, beginning next week, I'm doing it twice a week. So you show up twice a week, you get to speak twice a week. And uh, Fred, uh, Brian, Jackson are part of my, my group. You show up and you get an opportunity to speak one, two, three, four, five, six, seven minutes. We provide some positive feedback and we help you understand. Yes, you do look at the camera because that is your audience and you get a chance to work on that. So we're encouraging anyone who has to speak in front of a group, teachers or speakers or just anyone who wants to work on their virtual presentation skills to show up and work on those skills. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's practice. It's, we videotape everything. We send out the videotape afterwards and watch yourself, listen to yourself and decide, was I really engaging? Did it work? What do I need to work on next time? So yeah, you're absolutely right. Toastmasters is a great place to be bad. It's a great place to work on your skills and, I just didn't find the opportunity to speak, you know, four or five times a year to be enough. So I figure if you can get a chance to speak every single week, you know, then that more is better. So, uh, but every opportunity you get is a good opportunity. So I just want to put a plug in for my public speakers club that meets virtually. And now we're actually doing it so we can uh, include people in Europe. So we're doing a, a program that uh, is convenient for European time as well. So wanted to throw that out there. And th th thank you, Al. And yes, practice, practice, practice. Broadcasting going all the way back to my early days of broadcast when we rolled tape and we had to cut and splice and do all that. That's, that dates me there. But we would roll everything, review everything. And one of the hardest things for broadcasters and for most speakers is hearing your own voice on tape coming back to you because you hear it in your head. You do not hear it through the room. And playback changes the way you talk and present on stage. So teachers, broadcasters, we're all going to become the same now. Because to do better with this, you've got to learn how you sound because it keeps that engagement going. Uh, Tyler, what other things right now are up and coming for teachers that you think you're going to be? Because the virtual stage is here. The hybrid is going to be here. Uh, some schools I know are saying Monday, Wednesday, Friday, live, Tuesday, Thursday, virtual. What do you think this will really all goes to? Where's the trend going to take us? Yeah, um, so I'll get to that in just a second. But before I forget, Al, if you would type in the information about your group, uh, I already know I have, like, I talked to someone today, um, a fairly well known Hollywood actor out of New York that had an incredible message but needs reps. And he would be a great candidate for your group. Um, I had a, a NFL football player last week, same thing, great message, great story, but he's not used to, to doing it in a virtual environment. Uh, so I, I want to send some people your way if you, you'll get the information there. As far as trends uh, going forward with teaching, oh, I wish I could say that this is going to radically change things for forever. But as we all know, education is one of the slowest industries to change. We're dinosaurs. We're teaching the same way now that we were 100 years ago. It's not right. Um, and so I, I think the good news is COVID has helped us see some of the error of our ways. We are seeing more innovative practices. Uh, and I think it is going to change in some small pockets. I think 
not only are we going to see more hybrid teaching in normal classrooms, but we're going to see more schools that pop up from this, more hybrid type schools that are involved with entrepreneurship and going to businesses and having some projects you work independent of school. I think we're going to see more and more of that. I think that this is going to speed up those trends. But unfortunately, I think for the most part, as soon as we can get back to teaching the way we've always taught, a lot of people are going to do absolutely that same thing. That's wonderful. Anyone else got a question? Uh, I've got one or two more left myself, but anyone else have a hand to raise or anything to throw in here? It's been a great discussion. And Al, thank you for throwing that in there. Um, oh, let me pop you on there. You're unmuted. Joanne? Oh, yes. oh sorry. <laughs> I thought I saw you raise your hand. See, that's the classroom. No. <laughs> you thing. You're going to get called on by the teacher. No, I was reading what Al put in. I <laughs> so um, let's go back to just the basic idea of students right now coming into the new year. Um, how are they going to kick this thing off, do you think? Is, is there an onboarding, a preparation? You know, like it used to be you go to school, get your books, you sign up for your classes, you have that meet and greet day. Since it's virtual, how are they going to get the word out and let every student know, here's your meet and greet day, come on in to the first assembly? How are schools going to do that? Well, our school normally has no uh, correspondence with parents and students over the summer. This summer, we have almost weekly emails going to parents. And we've already talked about the meet and greet, how to do it virtual. If you want more FaceTime with your teacher, you can set up a Zoom. So it's almost like parent-teacher conferences, but before school even starts, our, our school's been doing that. And I suspect a lot of other schools are doing similar things. So I, I, I do, you know, we're taking this seriously. The education profession is trying to do the best to, to help with kids out there and, and work with parents. Um, but it's a, a district by district basis. So, you know, it's going to go really well in some places. And, and like we saw in the spring, some places are just going to really struggle. So it, it is what it is. Tell us more about your school assembly, please. In the little bit we got left here, um, tell us more about the idea of beaming in guests can it be classroom to classroom? Can it be a big school assembly where everyone zooms on in? You have 300 students. How are you presenting this? What's going to happen with the school assembly? Yeah, so the way I've done it so far is I've just brought guests on and it's just me and, and the guest. And so I'm asking the questions. I'm recording them, doing some editing. So in post-production, I'm putting on some B-roll during you know, their introductions and things like that. So it's been a fair amount of editing, a lot of work for me. It's been my full-time job this summer. So instead of getting paid, I'm putting thousands of dollars and man hours into it. Um, but the cool thing is I was doing this even before COVID where every once in a while I would have a guest zoom in uh, and talk to my classroom, just specific to my classroom. And often it would, I, fortunately I know a few celebrities, so I'd have an actor or a professional athlete and they would zoom in. Um, I think any teacher can do that at this point. I think if you wanted five celebrities lined up in your class before the school year started, you could start doing some outreach now on social media and line up some pretty awesome guests that would be more than happy to come into your classroom. So I'm hoping virtual school assembly kind of sets the stage for that, that there'll be more of that outreach uh, going forward. Um, but, you know, the way that we've set it up is I'm just uh, – Presenters are coming on, they're sharing a short message, I'm interviewing them, uh, and then we're putting it on YouTube. So we have the first 50 episodes up, once school starts again, we'll do two a week, and I'm, I'm pre-publishing for the whole year, because once I'm teaching, I'm not going to have time for virtual school assembly. So I, I'm putting up 100 episodes before the school year even starts. So you're pre-producing and bringing it in. Fred, I'll be with you just one second. What about the teacher that wants to say, beam them in? And let's do it live. Is that even part of the discussion? Or do you think they're going to go more to the canned 10-minute talk, make sure they get them done, they rock on out of there? That's a question for administration. In, in my school, if I wanted to have a speaker come in and it was taking away from my normal curriculum time, um, there could be a problem with that. And so I, I would be really nervous about just bringing people in willy-nilly to speak to my classroom. Um, if I wanted to do that with the whole school, I'd set it up through administration and we'd set that up. Um, 
but I, I think teachers need to be careful with how they facilitate those kinds of things just because we try to do, you know, what's consistent with the rest of the school. Perfect. Fred, you're on. What, 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 what now, question do you got for us? I'm just wondering, so where, where is the opportunity for a youth speaker to come in, you know, to replace the auditorium speaking gig? I yeah. Mean, where, yeah. Where's yeah. the opportunity? I'm not a, I'm not an A-list actor. <laughs> yeah. I'm not an NFL. Who do you contact, Tyler? Or... Who do you reach out to? The administrator, the principal? Because, yeah, there's a lot of questions about that, Fred. How do you get in that pipeline? Yeah, you can reach out. I would reach out to superintendents and to principals first, uh, but often the way to get to them is through teachers. Um, now, I've had a lot of professional youth speakers come onto my show. We've had David Flood, we've had David Rendall, Mark Black, Joe Fingerhut, Rob Ferrey, some, some pretty well-known uh, youth speakers, and they specifically sought me out because they wanted to practice their virtual presentations on a small stage before taking it. I, I know right after Joe Fingerhut did his presentation for me uh, about a month ago, he started booking virtual presentations at his normal keynote fee, and he said, you know, I've practiced it. If you want to see an example of my work, it's on virtual school. Actually, his isn't on virtual school assembly yet, but I've had other speakers do that. And, and so it, it's outreach. You know, you, you'll need to connect with the normal people that you connected to to get booked for, for live engagements. They're booking virtual engagements. Now, not all of them and probably not for your full fee. Uh, but that is happening. I mean, and some people are killing it. My friend Clint Pulver, who's a drummer, he has a very high keynote and he's, you know, he's with the Premier Speakers Bureau and they're just shopping him around like crazy because his virtual presentation with the lights on the drums and stuff. I mean, it's, it's dynamic. Jason Hewlett, the same thing. I mean, they're getting a lot of virtual gigs uh, because they're really well known, but also because they're doing the outreach. So any speaker can be doing the same thing. It's just reaching out and, and seeing how you can fill a need. That's fantastic. Uh, we got just a few moments left here tonight. I want to let you guys know next week, Angela Stilwell is going to be on. She's the owner and founder of Speaker Consultant. She does the untapped strength. So we're going to have a speaker back on to talk about the virtual stage, how she's leveraging it, how she's doing exactly what Tyler was just saying, how she pivoted and kept the career going. So if you want to learn more about speaking, virtual stage coming up in august we're going to go to australia this is the coolest thing about the virtual stage i love i've been in india germany i've been in canada been in australia the virtual stage has opened up the passport to bring people in from all over the world to learn other perspectives and we're going to have a gal on on august 26th janet's going to join us and she's going to be talking about helping people get through the rough barriers of life the transitions that COVID is causing both for your career and personally. So it's speaking, leadership, and life. That's going to be really cool. we got more coming up as well, but I want to highlight those. And every Wednesday night, we are live doing a show like this. So if you want to follow, drop your emails in. We'll get you on our email list. And also, I want to make sure, Tyler, do you have any special gift, anything you want to uh, offer or connect with people before we uh, close out the show here tonight? Uh, I don't, but it sounds like a few people might benefit from being on my platform. Um, I'm wrapping up uh, all my presentations this last week. It's my last week for recording. But if you would really like to be on the virtual stage and do an, a, a school assembly, um, you can go ahead and, and contact me and we'll see if we can find time to record the, in the next week or so. Um, and if not, maybe we can table that and I can put you on my wait list for season three. So it sounds like that's something that might be of interest to some of y'all. Why don't you drop your email into the chat box? Uh, everyone, by the way, if you do not know this, the chat box has those three buttons, those three dots side by side by side. You can tap on that when we're about ready to close out. And I'll give you a warning. Tap on that and that saves all the chats, all the emails, all the links. You can download it and then you drop it into a Word document and you can actually look at it. So make sure before the show winds down in a moment to hit those dots, save it. That's one of those interactive tools that people are just learning about and every teacher, every presenter should be using that. I want to let everyone know that I do a 30 minute free consultation. Uh, I want to help people, teachers, speakers, leaders get better at this. If you want a 30 minute consultation, I give you three great points. Uh, I also have other services, but we have a dialogue. We do a Zoom call. You ask me questions. 
and we hopefully get you rocking better to keep you going in the next direction. If you are interested in that, I'm going to drop my email in here and you will be able to uh, get free access to that. And I'm happy to help you guys out, go to the next level of what you're doing as well. I hope this has been helpful tonight. I hope this conversation has only begun. I know Tyler and I are both being pulled into this on a lot of levels. I've already got two other people that I'm gonna be bringing on to talk about this from different perspectives because parents are being affected, students are being affected, schools, because of their budget, like Tyler said, are being slashed right now. So how do you do this? And the school year is right around the corner. So I encourage you guys to follow along, come on back. Tyler, any final parting shots for everyone here tonight? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, a lot of you guys are coaches and you're, you know, just like the rest of us, uh, our world's been turned upside down with COVID. So, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. The fact that you're here shows that you're interested in improving, you're being creative and innovative. So, uh, you know, I applaud you and your efforts and, and I think things are going to turn around, but even if they don't, I think there's a ton of opportunity right now coming out of this virtual environment. And so if you're developing the skills, you're going to have a lot of opportunities moving forward. Let me tack onto that as we say goodnight to everybody. There are more stages appearing. It used to be, it was always the rock stars, the John Maxwell's, the Tony Robbins. There was all of that. And then the, everyone else got kind of put off to the side or limited space. We're going to have more platforms emerging because the virtual stage, smaller venues will open up. Schools are going to open up. There's going to be more platforms for more speakers to get your teeth cut into this. So take it as a good thing. Thanks, everyone, for dropping in tonight. I'm so glad you can make it. Join us next week, 6 o'clock Mountain Time again, and we're going to have Angela Stillwell with us, and we're going to rip deeper back into it. Any questions offline, send us emails. Reach out to Tyler. And, of course, Al, thank you for the drop-in as well. That was perfect. Good night, everybody. Keep rocking the stage.